uh, kindly take their seats and we'll get started momentarily. Thank you. Because fat babies have no pride. Fat babies have no pride. Fat babies have no pride. Well, good morning. Welcome to this morning's session, uh, the first session of the arterial disease track entitled The Business of Medicine. I think this will prove to be a very interesting uh, session this morning with a lot of uh, unique presentations and very uh, important discussion. Uh, I, I applaud Joffre for including this in, in the course curriculum. I think this is a really important session. So I want to begin by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Abbas, who will discuss hospital and physician integration understanding the implication, and if it's right for your practice. Samir. Good morning. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to speak in this uh, wonderful course. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, talk about hospital and physician integration and uh, try to make it in 12 minutes. It's going to be a little hard, so bear with me a little bit. So, where we start? Why this is happening? And this is the main, this is the main slide. This is the crisis. Um, health care costs in this country, it's like out of control. We're losing private insurance. Uh, public insurance is giving better. We're 17.6, the GDP way above the curve comparing to every single country in the world. F more than 50% of this cost is physician and hospital. So it makes sense if we can save some money on both that we're gonna drop the cost of healthcare. So I remember when um, I was in private practice and then when been acquired by the hospital and I remember a couple of years ago when we were negotiating, one of the uh, f colleagues who's been practicing for 20, 30 years told me uh, this is not new. This is something happened in the past and it failed, so it's kind of like a cycle. I don't know why you're doing this. Well, he's right, but not quite. So in the past 20 years, always there is a form of uh, integration between physician and hospitals. So if you look at 1990, this model was there. The hospital decided to pur purchase uh, practices they believe in capitation. They want to give you a fixed salary to take care of these patients. HMO is developed. They want to give a, like $100,000, for example, to take care of this patient for this year, and et cetera. However, this failed miserably. And the reason it failed, I will tell you later, but it's, it didn't work. Fixed salary didn't work. HMO didn't work. So it changed dramatically. And we came out to increase the PPO, uh, HMO uh, almost disappearing, and they start there is a competition on a market share. Fee for service was the, uh, the way to pay. This is till 2009. What happened in 2009, the payment change. Fee for service is not anymore how we get paid. Because of this, the hospital and the physician, that integration came back in the pictures again, and I will show you. So he's right that this curve, the, it was like, increasing in 1919, the, the hospital started buying practices, and then it failed. But it comes back again, failed, and right now, it is coming back again in a different pattern, and we're gonna talk about it. So, this is the change why. When my friend, or your friend, signed the uh, payment reform, it's not a healthcare reform, it's a payment reform. You're not gonna get paid for your service. It's gonna be bundled, and not only bundled, it's going to be this term, value-based payment. That is the difference between now and 1990. And we're going to go over this. So they believe that fee-for-service is uncoordinated care, it's too expensive, and there is unnecessary duplication of service. So we have to find a new of payments, and that's what triggers the changes. As again, fee-for-service comparing to bundle payment. They both don't work. So we need to find a way, and that's a definition of clinical integration, is the way of a physician and a health system bridge the gap between the fee-for-service reimbursement world and tomorrow's value-based payment world. 
That is the most important. I think this is why uh, we need to find a way of integrations with the hospital. Type of integration, I'm not going to go over this. I'm going to just talk about the last two. You have multiple options. I think Dr. Shemjak is going to cover the options. So when I interview, when, when we were negotiating with the hospital, this is what the hospital tell you. This is, hey, it's great, just do it. It improves your service quality and efficiency, improve business performance. It's a defense move in response to competition. Also, it's offense move in anticipation for the competition. If you're the first to do it, then you don't have to worry about future competition. You know, provide the platform for future strategy and great integration. Okay. They might be right, because look at this. 70% of the physician practice were physician-owned in 2002. In 2008, is 50-50. The number of, look at the curve for hospital-owned versus physician-owned. Big changes from 2000 till 2009, 2000. 50% of the hospital now offered uh, to buy a practice to, uh, to employ physician. In 2002, it was 10%. This is a huge change. So if we look, it's like what hospital want and what physician wants. So what hospital, and actually this is a true, I mean, I'm not pro-hospital, but I will say they want a stable professional staff. They want a loyal and engaged physician. They want a high quality, cost-effective, evidence-based medicine, and they want a leadership. But the physician, we want everything, right? We want state-of-the-art facility. We want access to information technology. We want a support to practice, professional uh, uh, practice managers. So we have to come somehow in between. This is a very busy slide, but let me summarize it for you. And this is maybe the most important slide, why this is happening. Let's talk about it. One, your salary is going down. From 1995 till 2003, there is 7% drop in the salary. That's a fact. You're not going to make money like what you made in the 90s and early 2000s. So, guarantee income may be a good thing. That's number one. Number two, look what's happening around. When I, was, when I joined my private practice initially, we take call every other weekend, we take call every other day, we, 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 we work maybe like till 11, 10 o'clock. This pattern is not the way to go right now. It's very difficult to hire a new grad and tell them that you're gonna take call every other weekend or every third weekend. They look for lifestyle, they want to guarantee income, that's what they care for. So if you live in a private practice world, it's gonna be very difficult to hire a new uh, grad. So because of this, that model of hospital employed might be not the wrong way to go. The other thing, this is not a strange subject, you can talk about it. Everybody talks about it. Do you work for the hospital or so? It's kind of like more accepting. From a hospital perspective, they are in shortage. The baby boomers are coming. You don't have enough specialties. They want some physician to take care of the service. So they would rather to employ. And last thing is, there is a pressure on the hospital to save money and cost. And way, one way of to do it to work with the physicians. So this is why you need to pay attention because you might have a very good practice and the hospital will take it and make it like it lose money. So it's not always like great. So they might take a very successful practice and they tell you, hey, you're losing money. Why? Because they take away office, they take away ancillary, the carpet, the painting is not important. They move you to a different uh, space. They put you in this room to save money. They tell the staff, you know, after five o'clock, you have to shut down everything. They think about, um, how we are going to save money by not expanding. We don't want to like expand more, but we want to keep what we have. This is the mentality. And this is, oh, they put your overhead comparing to, for example, as a cardiologist to the Department of Medicine overhead. And then it looks like, you know, you're not making money. You're losing money. They open the room for the self-pay and non-insured patient. And they tell you you're not making money. So these are the things that make you wonder why I am losing money and I, two years ago, I was like making a lot of money for the practice. So, because it's two different culture, really. Physicians, we are independent, we make decisions, we like to make sense, and we hate, we hate hierarchy. And I'm dealing with it every day. Look at, we work with the hospital, great. The value, the mission, the, I don't wanna take a risk. 
We have to be careful. We respect hierarchy. We, we like to work as a group. This politics part is a killer for us as a physician, and that's why you know we have two different cultures. So what are the options? And I'm just going to go over two options, and I'm going to give you one more about the ACO. The options that we have is practice acquisition model. This is not what I have. I'll tell you what my, the second one is what we have right now. But this is the most common. The hospital will purchase the assets of the physician practice. There is a goodwill payment. They pay upfront for this practice. In turn, the physician in a practice agrees to enter into employment agreement with the purchaser, and there is maybe an exit strategy and other issues employed the non-physician staff. So basically, they pay money up front, and you'll become employed for the hospital. The second one is what we have in our practice. It's a lease model. The hospital does not pur pur purchase the asset. You still own the asset. You still own the charts. The physician will become employed. They take, the hospital take over their management. They took over the administration. They took over the overhead. But you still own the asset, the charts. Why this is, I think, it's kind of attractive for physician, because it's also easier for re-entry into a private practice. If it doesn't work, you go back right there, private practice. The hospital will like it because they don't have to pay you money up front. So they don't, you keep the patients, and if you don't like it, you come out. Now, it's complicated a little bit, needs a lot of lawyers. So when you go into agreement for employment agreement, you need to know the terms. <clears throat> I think non-compete is nonsense. That's absolutely no. You need to know your duties, clinical, non-clinical. You have a little bit of practice governance and control. And the last thing is compensation. So we go back to the 90 when people say that it fails. It fails because they give you a fixed income. We're a human being. If you don't pay me, I don't know. Maybe I, I don't have to work till 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. So incentive is very important. You RVUs, or based on RVUs and collection, there is a baseline salary with RVUs. That's the model that's happening right now. Um, so the other one, I just want to talk very briefly about ECO because you don't have to be always employed by the hospital. You can be part of ACO. ACO, by definition, Medicare defined it as organization healthcare provider agrees to be accountable for quality, cost, and overall care of Medicare patients who are enrolled in the ACO. What that means? It doesn't have to be a hospital, group of physicians might be. They're willing to be accountable for the quality care, overall care of Medicare patients. They have to sign a program at least for three years. They have some legal structure so they get paid and they pay the individuals. And finally, they have to have a certain number of phys uh, physicians employed and at least 5,000 patients. So you can join an ACO to get paid. How you get paid, the government pay you and an ACO, uh, ACO pay the provider. And the key here, there is a way to save money and get paid back based on quality standards and based on if you really prove that you cost, uh, you save some cost and you cut cost for the patients. That's defined by the HHS. There is barriers. The barriers, we know that. Past experience, people hesitant. Concern about ability to expand. When you become employed by a hospital, the unemployed physician might have like, changed in the way that they look at you. Competition from other systems. And is your organization really able to take over this and manage your practice? That's, these are the barriers right now. But the bottom line and the conclusion, payment reform will only increase pressure for hospital and physician to integrate. The key is, Determining what integration platform your organization should be developing now to be prepared for further integration in the future. It is coming. Questions? Thank you very much. My uh, topic is to share with you my perspective, uh, lessons learned from hospital physician alignment to hopefully make your transition easier. Uh, in the way of disclosures, uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist that have been in practice since 1988. Uh, a lot of my career has been in solo uh, private practice with uh, large uh, multi-specialty cardiology practices in Kansas City and Cincinnati. But more recently, I have been an employee of a large healthcare system in Milwaukee and southeastern Wisconsin. 
As an employed physician, I have been very active as a physician leader, uh, department chair, division chairman, member of the medical executive committee, director of the cardiovascular lab, and the medical director of the cardiovascular institute. So I have a lot of administrative duties as an employed physician. Well, let's step back and uh, recall what our expectations were when we all embarked on our careers. I think most of us were incredibly optimistic. Uh, you know, we had very high, lofty goals. I think we still have those high expectations. But clearly, the landscape has changed. Why is that? I think, what is the perspective today? There is increasing uncertainty about the future of medicine as a whole. Uh, there is increased regulatory pressure and scrutiny. Uh, it's a daily activity. There's no question there is intense financial pressures that we are all dealing with and concerns. A decrease in our level of control, uh, whether you're in private practice or employed. Uh, there is tremendous change in your level of control uh, as a practitioner. I think as a profession and as individual physicians, regardless of your relationship, we are increasingly being devalued. And there is no question there is increasing competition, peer pressure, loss of collegiality. And those all translate to potential loss of personal and professional satisfaction. To add to that, there's no question we have lost social standing. This is a survey that was published recently, uh, and the, the surveyors just simply asked, does the United States have the best health care? And it's interesting that currently, most people that were surveyed believe that we do not. This is an interesting quote from a health care consultant. Doctors can be replaced by software. 80% of them can. I'd much rather have a good machine learning system diagnose my disease than the median or average doctor. So clearly, we have a lot of social pressures to deal with as well. The net result of all this is that the landscape is different. It's not as promising as it once was. And it's very uncertain. It's shifting. It's moving constantly. And you have to anticipate the changes that are coming and be prepared for it. You've seen some of this data presented uh, in the last presentation. This is data from uh, 2010, looking at the relationships uh, of uh, physicians to hospitals. 55% uh, at that time were still uh, in, uh, not employed or under contract, but 45% were, were in some way related to the hospital, whether they were employed, group contract, or individual contracts. This is a, a more recent analysis looking at trends in physician hospital alignment, independent, hospital employed, joint venture contract. And you can see graphically the changes that have taken place since 2004. If we look at individual cardiovascular practices in physicians, the same trends exist to a varying extent. Between 2007 and 2012, a significant drop in the percentage of physicians that were independent translates to increase uh, in the number of physicians that were hospital-owned, more than a threefold increase between 2007 and 2012. In terms of practices, hospital-owned cardiovascular practices, again, significant increase, threefold increase with a corresponding drop in physician-owned cardiovascular practices. Why is that? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this. The number one reason is increasing financial pressure. Falling reimbursement, coupled with rising uh, overhead costs, employees, salaries, benefits, facility costs, equipment, electronic medical record, uh, and uh, all contribute to a loss of revenue stream. All of this has translated uh, to changes in uh, relationships with the hospital. Another primary driver, however, is the change in the primary care providers' relationships with hospitals. Many of them have now been acquired by large healthcare systems, and that potentially disrupts the referral base and redirects that. Also, changes in insurance plans and preferred provider lists may limit access to patients who traditionally were available to your practice. The pressures that we deal with as physicians and as practices are not unique to us. The hospitals and the healthcare systems are dealing with the same pressures. 
This is uh, their top concerns for hospital-owned practices from the hospital's perspective. Same issues, Medicare reimbursement cuts, uh, reimbursement as a whole, billing and coding, you know, operational costs all translate to increased financial pressure for them as well. So I want to spend the next few minutes talking about some of the different hospital physician models. And we'll just quickly move through these four models. The practice acquisition employment model. Theoretically, the physician employment should create the strongest alignment with the hospital. It requires a large financial outlay from the hospital. All practice assets are acquired at a fair market value price. The physicians become fully employed and compensation legally has to be within fair market value. The advantages to the hospital. Uh, this offers full alignment with the cardiologists. It can protect strategically important practices. It can achieve a more control over the referral and practice pattern. And it, the hospital gains control over compensation structure. But it has to do so within the legal uh, confines. The disadvantages to the hospital, I guess another way to look at that is the advantage to the physician. It requires purchase of all assets, it requires employment of all physicians, and the asset purchase price can be high. What about the uh, MSO model, the management service organization? Physicians are employed in this model, but the hospital is not required to uh, purchase the practice assets. The hospital contracts with the cardiologist's owned MSO, which is essentially the former private practice, in order to provide support services to the hospital. The MSO retains ownership of the practice assets, is in charge of managing the non-clinical staff. In exchange for a fair market fee, the MSO provides office space, management support, billing services, the, the infrastructure uh, operational aspects. But the practice infrastructure is still in place. And by virtue of that, the practice can easily reestablish or unwind and, and, uh, if the employment contract is terminated with the hospital. Full employment and the PSA model do not allow for such early uh, reestablishment of the practice. So the advantages of the MSO model to the hospital, it does not require a large capital commitment. The hospital avoids purchasing the non-strategic location and equipment, and it can be unwound with relative ease. The disadvantages to the hospital, if the physicians maintain ownership of the MSO, it's easier for them to terminate the relationship in the future. And the structure is a little bit more complicated. What about the PSA? This offers many of the benefits of integration, but does not involve physician employment. The hospital purchases and assumes operation of the practice assets, but the existing physician remain independent. Instead, the hospital contracts with those physician groups to provide defined professional services. The advantages of this model to the hospital is that it can selectively engage strategically important physicians. It doesn't have to take on the whole practice. The agreement has some flexibility, and there are varying degrees of service commitments. The disadvantage is that all assets and equipment must be purchased. It offers less strength of the alignment as the physicians are not employed, so there's a greater degree of autonomy. The hospitals must be competent in cardiology practice operations, which we've heard is not always true. And there can be problems in terms of physicians becoming alienated uh, if, if things are not moving smoothly. And the asset purchase may be high. And finally, what about co-management? This model offers alignment while allowing the hospital and physician groups to maintain independence. The hospital assigns the clinical management of a specific service line to a third party, often an LLC, which is owned by the physician group. The physician participation in the LLC, LLC has to be open, and the participating physicians are compensated via two components. They're paid on a fair market hourly rate for time spent managing the department or the cardiovascular service line. They also have the potential to gain uh, incentive payments contingent on performance goals. These goals must be meaningful and provide sufficient value to the hospital, and they are the subject of a lot of legal scrutiny uh, on the part of the government, so they've got to be in compliance. The co-management arrangement can be quickly negotiated and is a really a, a fairly good alternative to the other alignment options and relatively easy to implement. 
What are the advantages for the hospital with this model? Because the physicians are compensated based on involvement, the hospital may be able to more selectively engage the most strategically relevant physicians. You can read between the lines with that. Relatively straightforward structure uh, that can be easily implemented. The disadvantages to the hospital, it may be difficult to achieve buy-in from all physicians, uh, and it will likely not change the existing dynamics. So having said that, what are the lessons that I have learned over the last few years being an employed physician and looking at these models uh, from previously being in private practice? I think what I would recommend as you embark on this, you have to look at your current state and realistically predict your future, your individual future and your practice's future. You have to examine all of the options that are available, and these may be very different depending upon your market and depending upon your environment. You've got to solicit the help of other people. Talk to physicians and other practices that have lived through this prior to your uh, endeavors. Uh, get consultants and talk to lawyers and understand the legal implications before you embark on that. You have to understand as you embark on this, like anything in, in any practice, your colleagues will have a varying perspective depending upon their careers, where they, where they are in their careers, what their priorities are, and what their motivation is. You have to strive for balance and compromise, but it's going to be a difficult undertaking regardless of which model you pursue. The net result of all of this exercise is that it's incredibly laborious and very expensive as you start to bring in the lawyers. In terms of negotiating with a hospital, hospital partner, there's no question, timing is essential. You don't want to be too early, but you don't want to be the last one in. So you've got to be mindful of the appropriate timing. You've got to understand where the hospital's coming from. What is their financial performance and what is their strategic position? Is this a viable partner uh, to, to align yourself with? Examine their previous behavior and commitment. Look at other practices that have lived through this already and talk to those people and see how it's going. And understand their relationships with other physician groups. You know, they have relationships not just with employed groups, but with contracted groups, relationships with independent practices, and understand what that dynamic is and how it'll affect you if you become aligned or with one of the other models. And look at their organizational structure and how successful it is. Regardless of, of how you go, the contract and the terms of, of the contract uh, are fundamental. There's just no way around it. That is the binding agreement. The hospital administrators come and go. They are constantly in flux. And even if they stay, their perspective changes. So they are anything but constant. Their priorities will change. Uh, there's just no question. It's inevitable. The best day will be the day you sign that contract in terms of your relationship with the hospital. Beyond that, it's a downward curve. Your greatest asset is you. It's you and your practice and how you conduct yourself professionally. Regardless of what you do, you have to fulfill the terms of the contract that you have signed to them. At a minimum, adhere to that. Adhere to your principles and the standards that have made you successful in your private practice. Don't negotiate that away. I think it's important to continue to invest in the growth and the success of your individual practice. Regardless of what happens with the hospital, you at least have that to hold on to. And remember, ultimately, what we are about is providing optimal patient care. I'll conclude with this famous contemporary philosopher, the future ain't what it used to be. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Golzer, thank you for the invite. It's been a great meeting so far. Uh, um, I have the task to talk to you about uh, moving uh, our um, uh, pro uh, endovascular procedures to the outpatient centers. <clears throat> um, let's look at a uh, little historic uh, background here. Uh, outpatient medical procedures have begun shifting about 20 years ago 
with the formation of the uh, ASCs, the ambulatory surgical centers, and the renal dialysis centers. Cardiac catheterizations and endovascular lab services at the time were just a normal migration that uh, moved from previously exclusive, exclusively being done in the hospital to the outpatient center. So Medicare, as of January 1st, 2005, approved physicians performing peripheral intervention in an outpatient facility, and they created a financial uh, coding for it accordingly, which has been on the decline since. And I just uh, heard from two different people today that uh, we are in jeopardy of a further cut, uh, immediate cut, starting uh, in January. So what, uh, what, uh, what are the dri uh, drivers to make that decision to move from the hospital-based uh, uh, lab to the outpatient lab. For physicians, we are in the comfort zone in the hospital. We feel we're, 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 uh, we're safe. Uh, however, let me tell you, once, once you do that step, it's probably you, you, you look back and say, it's the best thing I've ever done. It improves your work efficiency by removing the unknown variables that uh, are affecting the hospital schedule and case turnover. It allows you to enhance patient satisfaction by becoming directly involved in the decisions. And you see yourself interacting directly with the patients on one-to-one -one basis. And uh, at many, many occasions, you see that uh, you interact several times at, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a day uh, with the patient and their family. And uh, obviously, uh, the last piece is increased practice income by recovering more, more, more of the technical and the facility fee. That's something that we've been uh, under, uh, <clears throat> under the gun for the past uh, few years. So why office-based? Uh, I don't think he's a, he's a popular guy today uh, from what we've heard among, uh, <laughs> among the previous speakers. However, Obviously, we were promised, uh, we're, we're led to believe that the, by reducing the premiums by $2,500, we're going we're gonna to really save uh, 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 the GDP uh, substantially. Well, actually, it's going to be costlier. So we have, the government has to deal with this. So your wish is, your, is our command. Uh, Office-based procedure is very convenient, like we said, to, to the patient, the physicians, less costly. Uh, and it's obviously less costly to the insurance companies, but it seems like they're, they're not understanding it very well. One of the best ways that I think this is going to be directly understood is through the accountable care organizations, and I should say the, the, the non-hospital-based accountable care organizations. If you look at, the, uh, at this slide, you look at the risk versus the reward, obviously. Uh, uh, if you look at a different coding, whether it's angioplasty, angioplasty and atherectomy, with or without stenting, you see that there's a substantial uh, financial reward. But this is a bundled, this is a bundled uh, uh, price. Uh, this includes the, the, uh, all the devices, includes balloons, includes overhead, includes everything. And in a facility, if you look at the extreme right in a facility, that's what the physicians get paid for, uh, for, these, uh, for these codes. Uh, by, by looking at the non-facility uh, uh, numbers, these obviously there's, there's, there's a reward, but there's a, there's a financial risk behind it. Remember, you have to pay for all the supplies. So what procedures can you do? can do just about everything except uh, therapeutic cardiac procedures, triple A's and carotid stenting. This is, this is essentially uh, what, the, uh, what the spread of uh, the type of procedures that can be done. Uh, I should say diagnostic angiography is, is, uh, can be done in about 39 states. Actually, it's about 40 states. But the financial, financial benefit to this has not been uh, very, uh, very rewarding. Uh, in terms of, uh, some people ask me, can we do uh, subclavian artery uh, interventions? Are, yes, but you cannot do carotid stenting. You can do carotid angiography, but no carotid stenting. And in terms of dialysis access, maintenance, and embolizations, all of it uh, is, a, is, is a go. So just imagine being more productive, provide continuity of care to your patients, offer a patient-friendly environment, 
have more control, increase your revenue, walk into your, to your favorite place. It's really a different, different environment than walking into the hospital. I was, I was in a leadership position for, uh, for seven years and on the board of trustees for uh, our system for seven years. And let me tell you, what a feeling for the past eight months being involved in this, uh, in this venture. There's no travel time running between places. You don't have to wait for the hospital procedure room to be free. Uh, if this is an office-based, you can see your patients in between. Your patients will get used to seeing the same staff and spend more time with everybody. And there's a one-to-one -one, uh, direct care. Uh, it's a very friendly atmosphere. Uh, you can make it as comfortable and as friendly as you want. And the scheduling, there's quite a bit of flexibility in the scheduling. You have, to con you have control over the patient's environment, setup of the procedure room, your schedule, devices, contracts, full autonomy. Many procedures performed in the office are reimbursed at much higher rate than, uh, uh, than the professional fees. The higher global, though, global fees include professional fees and technical facility fees that would have gone to the hospital. So what are your options? Going solo, having a joint venture with the hospital, or having a joint venture with national company. The former speakers have talked to us about a joint venture with the hospital in a, in a different format. What are the pros and cons for either, being solo or uh, joining the hospital? Going solo, the pros are you have complete control over the management of the facility and you collect 100% of the technical fee. However, the cons are that you take all the financial risk, you have potential conflict with the hospital, and there's always procrastination. You know, there's physicians, they have a hard time moving out of that comfort zone. There's always a delay in breaking ground, procrastination, lack of time. And there's one of the important things is lack of expertise. We have not gone to business school as doctors for most part. When we finish our, uh, our uh, training, our, uh, uh, our schooling, uh, we are quite deficient in our business sense. We don't understand business. So how about joint venture with the hospital? I have not been a big fan of it, personally. I have never seen a physician coming on top. And you know, the advantages, there are obviously some, is to avoid conflicts with the hospital. You know, the hospital can squeeze you out. You can share financial risks. Most, for most part, they have a lot of money, although they claim that they don't. Always remember that hospitals, they, 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 report, they report a certain earning or losses. But behind every hospital, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, there's an enterprise that, that, that does the business for the hospital. And that's the entity that, that, uh, uh, where they can hide money or do outside businesses. And we'll talk about it in my, in my uh, next talk. So the disadvantages to work with the hospital is, is in complete control over the management. Total, uh, you lose total control and you share collection of the technical fee and affiliation with one hospital in a multiple hospital city. You have, uh, you have to understand that. And obviously the bureaucracy. How about joint venture with a national company? And that's exactly what we did. Uh, the advantages are is that partners primarily focus as the, as the office-based facility the office-based facility. And remember, the, the billing is done under the doctor's uh, NPI number, under this model. There's shared financial risk in some, but the way we, we structured it ourselves is that the financial risk was shared uh, by, the, uh, by the national company. And uh, my uh, partner, Mr. Greenberg, will be talking about, uh, about this in the, in the, uh, in the next uh, uh, talk. There's uh, equity participation relative to financial risk involvement, uh, partnered with building and regulatory experience, ability to adopt new technologies. You have full total freedom, actually, uh, to provide the, uh, the, the, best, uh, the best care to your patient and provide uh, in a, uh, a great environment to your colleagues. What are the disadvantages? 
you know, I mean, people, uh, physicians feel that there's a potential hospital conflict, and there will be. You take a physician, a very busy physician out of the hospital, and you put them next door in an outpatient facility, they're going to feel it, and they will feel it. Uh, there's incomplete control over the management of the facility, and that's something you have to work out with the, with the company, as well as, you know, one of the advantages is sharing the collection of the technical fee. However, uh, there are different models. What's our vision? I will not bore you with this, but that's, uh, that's, that's what it is. Our mission is to provide basically uh, the, uh, the, a, 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 the, the best care uh, to our patient at the, at the lowest cost. And the scope of our practice is, it, uh, it, uh, this is it. It uh, uh, includes at, uh, uh, peripheral intervention, atherectomy, stenting, renal, visceral, iliac, uh, balloon angioplasty, uh, uterine fibroid embolizations, uh, vascular access, declots, permacath, etc. Uh, kyphoplasties can be done, vertebroplasties, and diagnostic uh, angiography. As far as the vein treatment, all of it may be done. However, DVT treatment is, 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 is a procedure that should be done in the hospital. Let me go over a couple of cases. What is your garden variety? Uh, uh, one of the male uh, cases that you should be starting with in an outpatient lab. These are before and after atherectomy and angioplasty cases. Uh, tot short total occlusion of the SFA followed by angioplasty. Pretty decent result after. One may argue that they would do a little bit more. Remember, be cautious about the use. When you do this, you have to be very cautious about overdoing it. Just be very cautious with the contrast material, be very cautious with the, with the time spent, procedure time, floor time, and, and it is always good to defer. It's always good to stage your procedure. You know, popliteal cases before and after, um, another popliteal case, uh, uh, below the knee case, and this is very, very important. Although you could do this, many of us have done these in the hospital, never, never in an outpatient lab you should expose yourself and the patient to a case like this and recanalize a CTO of the iliac artery. I'm going to skip this slide and move to the next. I think I've uh, gone over time a little bit. We've talked about the pros and cons. And uh, what are the recommendations, really? This will allow you to become completely involved in OB. As a, as, a, as a physician in the OBL development process at all levels, most of these tasks cannot be delegated to the office manager. You have to be involved in every step. You have to learn about every step. There's so much to learn initially. You have to utilize experienced staff, pay them a little bit more. The OBL staff, team members are key to patient satisfaction. You gotta find your rhythm. Recreate the same workflow as in the hospital. Very important. Start slow and build on the complexity and the volume of cases and I've shown you. Right now, we have been doing CT, uh, CTOs on a regular basis and we have had outstanding outcomes. Uh, although we have, uh, I, I have a rule, we have, you know, we use filters on every case. Don't ever overreach. There are other options and site of service. Staging is a good thing. And you are responsible for the satisfaction of the patient, regulatory board, staff, and yourself. This is our center in Dearborn, Michigan. These are the type of uh, physicians we work together. And we've been very, very collegial. This has not been the same in 1999 when we first started doing endovascular at the hospital. Make sure you have state-of-the-art equipment. This is a uh, Zeem flat panel, C-arm. We have two rooms, uh, holding areas. And that's the best. That's the best investment we have. It's our staff. <clears throat> Yes, we do have to transport our patients. <laughs> so let's talk, take 30 seconds to talk about accreditation. It is a voluntary process. 
through which a healthcare organization is able to measure the quality of its services and performance against nationally recognized standards. So it's voluntary. You must be accredited, and I'll tell you why in the next talk. Accreditation with a nationally recognized organization is resource intensive, but is invaluable in helping to maintain a high quality of operational standards. And we are in the process of doing it right now. So in conclusion, office-based lab offers a better experience for the patients, to the doctor, financially, it's a good opportunity for physicians, and it, it has, uh, offers a lower cost to the payers. Thank you. I'm just going to move to the next talk, I think. Um, I was asked to give my opinion about whether all of this will be here by the next two to five years, and if I have to bet on it, I would say yes. Today, 20% 20 of, um, uh, 20 of uh, endovascular uh, procedures are done uh, outpatient and 80% inpatients. And my prediction, my, this is my personal prediction, is that in the next five years, we're going to see a flip in these numbers. So if we ask five physicians whether after, after, under, after knowing what we know and after seeing what we've seen, is this going to be there? I think four, or five, four out of five docs will be, will be saying yes. So what are the outlooks for outpatient services? Well, the demand for outpatient or ambulatory surgery center is growing in Europe, India, all over the world. It's, it's substantially growing. In the U.S., uh, outpatient surgical center industry includes about 3,500 companies that operate about 5,000 centers and have a combined annual revenue of about $18 billion. The industry is expected to experience high growth, high growth, and patients are seeking lower cost alternative to hospital care. I want to just tell you a couple of things about place of service. This is very, very important. And I think I would like to link this to the previous two talks uh, and I will mention uh, once, once we discuss 21 and 22. A place of service 11 is your hospital practice, essentially. It's whatever you do in the hospital and you bill as a POS 11. When the hospital administrations lobbied for, uh, uh, to maintain a fee, almost a fee for service for the hospital reimbursement, they secured a POS 21, which is the inpatient hospital services provided on an inpatient basis, and a POS 22, which is a hospital-based payment under a hospital, uh, so it's the HAPS program, the Hospital Outpatient Prospective Payment System, which really is what a 22, a POS 22 is all about. This is what the hospitals did when they came and they lured physicians to come and join their ranks, whether through a PSA or co-management or whatever, uh, except co-management, uh, uh, is, is they told the physicians, you're going to be able to build two times, two and a half times more or for, for diagnostic services, so on and so forth. And, uh, and the 24 is the ASC. So under, under POS 22, for the same procedure, the hospital is able to, to, to charge two and a half times more what you would charge under a POS 11. And they, when they ask you to come and join their ranks, they've asked you, they, they, they've, they've, they've shared some of this benefit with you and for many, for many other reasons that Dr. Shimshak talked about, this was one of the most important luring carrots. So we've seen over the past 10 years uh, a, a substantial uh, rise in the office-based uh, surgeries. Uh, in, uh, in 2010, there were 10 million procedures performed. The popularity has been increasing. What are the drivers? It's the development of minimally invasive surgical techniques and new forms of anesthesia have permitted physicians to provide a broader scope of services in their offices. Many insurers no longer pay for extended hospital stays. I, 
I see healthcare, the hospital of the future is gonna be a big intensive care unit. If you're not too sick, you shouldn't be in the hospital. If you're not too sick, you shouldn't be in the hospital. Patients don't wanna be in the hospitals. Doctors don't wanna to go to the hospitals. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we can save, it's substantially, substantially save uh, costs. So patients have been, driven, have been drawn to the office space surgical setting. Additionally, the OBS offers physicians a greater degree of control and, and, and independence. Well, unfortunately, so far in a lot of states, this, is, this has not been very well regulated and there's little oversight over OBS procedure. Some would call it the wild west of healthcare. However, over the past 10 years, this has been changing. Today, the 2003 studies primarily authored states that the risk associated with OBS have been largely diminished due to improved regulation by the state. So we've improved in, in the surgical centers, the infection rates, the performance, and outcomes have significantly improved since the state is imposing on us uh, uh, reg further regulations. And adding that outpatient uh, uh, base uh, centers save significantly on cost and now playing a critical role in, uh, role in healthcare. If you look at, at this slide, you look at how much we've been treating and how much we've been diagnosing, but there's so much more to do. And there's a significant drive at finding these patients, diagnosing these patients, with this aging population, population is becoming more obese, more diabetics. This is gonna put a big burden on healthcare unless we streamline it and provide it at a lesser, at a better cost. The hospital cannot do that. The hospital cannot do that. And let me tell you why, I'm gonna to skip to this slide. If you, look at, if you look at the fourth line, you see that PTA stent atherectomy reimburses a physician in office, $14,200. This may change. Uh, in the hospital, the physician gets paid for this service, $777. If you see the hospital, the hospital inpatient is $7,000. You say, my God, it's better than the hospital. But if you look, the hospital bills for everything, every device, all the supplies, anesthesia, physician fees, diagnostic. I will give you an example of a patient of mine that we did a total SFA on in June of 2012. He had a complication, he had developed a hematoma, it was recanalized, and the patient had a CAT scan, there was a little retroperitoneal bleed, and left in the afternoon the next day. He brought the, he was very unhappy, he, had a, he, he was hurting for about a month, and he came back to the office, was very leery about having his other leg done, although he was a, he was a severe clodicant. Finally, we opened up the lab in uh, October of 2012, and he was agreeable to come and join us. And uh, we did the other leg on an outpatient basis. He had a one-to-one -one care, actually two-on-one care, and uh, he was extremely satisfied, no complications. And he came back to the office, and he, I wish I had uh, this slide to show it to you. The hospital bill was about $45,000, $46,000 for the same procedure that ended up bad. Why? Because the patient was in a setting that was not dedicated for that purpose. It was in the holding area of the cath lab, and I don't know if you've seen holding areas. We, we, there's, the, the care is excellent, however, they cannot, they cannot provide a one-to-one -one care in, in that, that setting. $45,000 for one leg. At the outpatient center, the bill was $12,000 with better outcome. It's almost, it's almost one, uh, uh, one quarter of the cost. So, Obviously, I'm a big proponent. I think because of lower patient costs, lower patient, uh, payer costs, and in a better, uh, in a safer environment, this is here to stay. So the question is for how long? The Affordable Care Act is still the big unknown. Uh, however, we know that 
between what we've learned about the Affordable Care Act five years ago and today, it's going to be costly. And through the ACOs and our relationships with the, uh, with the payers, I think that, uh, that, uh, that uh, partnering with outpatient, uh, on an outpatient basis, with outpatient facilities, is going to be the better way to go. However, we have to prove that, that the quality is there, because so far, we're not very well supervised. So at this point, we have to be diligent at supervising our, our, ourselves. This is not a, not a loose process. We have to govern ourselves. We have to regulate ourselves. We are responsible for the patient and staff's uh, safety. We have to, uh, we have to, uh, we really have to voluntarily get, uh, uh, get uh, uh, accredited. And, uh, and uh, if we look at how can we sustain, there are a lot of drivers you have to have a good marketing, uh, marketing uh, team, which we have uh, just finished structuring. The future here, we have to partner with the ACOs, which, can, uh, which are going to allow us to provide that valued care, the best patient care at the lowest costs. We can talk about group uh, uh, purchasing organizations, which will help at reduce that cost. They're available. How about cardiac catheterization? Is it worth it? Financially, it's not. Financially, it's not. Even though in 40 states it can be done, in Michigan you need a certificate of need, it doesn't make much sense at this point. It is better to do it under, under a POS 21 in the hospital at this point. I'm going to end that here, and thank you very much. Discuss what you need to know to start and maintain a successful office-based lab at Greenberg. Hi, thank you very much for having a uh, business person. I'm not a physician. Um, give you a little background on uh, what it takes to start a successful lab. Um, first, wanted to give you a little uh, background on. on uh, our experience um, in office-based labs. Uh, we started our company about three years ago developing uh, dialysis access, primarily uh, outpatient labs to focus on dialysis access procedures with vascular surgeons. Um, that time, uh, reimbursement for uh, atherectomy in the office-based setting was just coming into existence, January 1, 2011. And, you know, we kind of quickly realized that, you know, reimbursement for uh, peripheral cases was significantly better than doing dialysis access work. But we also saw that there was uh, a significant increase in the, uh, the international dominant dialysis uh, companies, uh, Fresenius and DeVita, uh, getting involved with outpatient um, vascular centers. Um, and we felt like the risk of just being in dialysis access was really too great um, and wanted to combine these centers into um, office-based labs that can really do anything that, for example, Dr. Kassab's already gone over that can be done and is fairly reimbursed in an outpatient setting. So at this juncture, we've developed a number of centers. Um, in all cases, they, they uh, the physicians involved do a variety of types of cases. Um, what we've kind of learned um, is that in most cases, a single physician practice or a small practice really can't financially sustain an office-based uh, uh, investment in a center. And what we've recently been doing is focusing on uh, bringing physician groups together um, to allow um, individual sites to be um, hopefully very successful. Uh, Movi, uh, Dr. Kassab Center is uh, one of the most recent and, and a real good example of a uh, situation where we've brought at this point about 16 different physicians into that facility who are currently doing cases. Um, and that involves um, interventional cardiologists, vascular surgeons, and interventional radiologists. Um, in terms of you know, defining success, I think there's really two components of how we define success. 
Certainly, um, this office-based setting is going to give you the opportunity to get substantially greater uh, profitability for your practice. I mean, how do you get back that 7% that, that uh, was talked about earlier in terms of uh, losses in your practice? Well, this is a way to get substantially better than 7% back a year um, by getting involved in an outpatient setting. I think the physicians we've been involved with uh, to, a, uh, to a person are, uh, you know, have seen incredible profitability in the short time they've been involved with these centers. Um, there's also that convenience factor. There's no question that working in your own lab is going to increase your flow through anywhere from 15 percent to probably 75 percent, depending on, you know, what it's like to do cases in your, in your current hospital. You know, and that ultimately translates into uh, increased profitability and use of your time. Um, this is kind of a familiar looking slide, but you know, it's, it's intended to indicate the difference between what you get basically on a global basis in the outpatient setting versus the fees you get for doing a procedure in the hospital. One of the things I want to point out, um, I, I've met a lot of physicians that think that you get both, that you get a facility fee as well as what's called the non-facility fee when you're in the outpatient setting. You don't. There's only one global fee, and that's the uh, column on the left in this case. I think in evaluating um, whether you should get involved um, when, a, when an office-based center and what's involved in setting it up, I think you first got to, you know, be a little bit honest about uh, what your capabilities are. You know, do you really have the team or the individual skills to pull off opening up a center? Um, I can tell you I've met physician groups, very, very large physician groups, um, that had an organization that certainly looked something like this in size, if not greater, um, that believed that they could open, you know, a successful lab. Um, in some cases, it's been two or three years and they still haven't opened. So there are a lot of moving parts, um, and I think, you know, if you've got to focus on your practices, um, and your patients, um, it becomes very, very difficult to, to get a lab opened at the same time. But, you know, what we're going to go through now very quickly is, you know, what you have to look at um, in terms of evaluating, um, you know, whether your center is going to be successful, whether it's worth the effort, um, especially if it's going to be uh, your own practice or your singular practice that's, that's uh, looking to open this lab. Um, first thing you need to look at is, you know, what kind of volume you have and what's the mix of that volume, okay? Are we, are we doing a lot of testing? Are we doing a lot of, uh, you know, leg cases? Are we doing a lot of dialysis access? You know, what kind of cases um, are we doing and what can we expect to do in the outpatient setting? You know, I've had over the years many physicians tell me they were going to do, you know, 100 cases a month in the office um, only to find that they were doing, you know, 40 or 50 cases, you know, a month in, in the office. Um, I don't think they were being dishonest with, with us. I think they, they really hadn't looked at their numbers very well. Um, sometimes um, seasonality comes into, into play in a practice. So you might have looked at, you know, your last month's month, uh, numbers, and, you know, they're not really representative of what an average month looks like when you, when you take into account vacation time, um, and, and everything else. But certainly the, the biggest thing you got to look at is, you know, how many of these cases am I going to really take out of the hospital? Um, you know, are these patients that, I, that, I, that presented to us as inpatients that are going to stay inpatient, obviously, um, or, you know, there's certainly a percentage, probably 20% of these patients that need to be, you know, cases done at the hospital. So, you know, I would encourage you first and foremost to, you know, get your uh, appropriate billing information, get your, get your records, analyze those numbers, um, and that's going to allow you at the end of the day to put together a financial forecast um, or have somebody, somebody help you put a financial fa uh, forecast together um, to demonstrate the viability of, of a center. So, you know, financial forecasts uh, for, for most of us, um, you know, that aren't uh, former CPAs like I am, um, could be a daunting task. But uh, again, you know, I encourage you to get the help to, uh, to really put, you know, numbers, um, you know, to paper. Um, the things that you've, you're going to have to get a handle on are, are uh, 
as I said earlier, first and foremost, looking at you know, what your expected volume is going to be and what the expected reimbursement is going to be related to that volume. But then we need to look at you know, where, where are we going to uh, put this facility and what's going to be associated um, with the cost of that facility. Um, am I going to have a you know, half a million dollar build out? Um, you know, what, you know, what's my rent going to be? Am I going to buy a building? You know, these are all things that need to be considered. The other items in the, in the forecast, including, like I said, the, the, uh, the revenue side of the equation is, is, is the expenses. Um, certainly, you've got to look at, you know, what kind of staffing you're going you're gonna to require in this facility. And as Dr. Kassab said earlier, I think, um, especially in this setting, you really want to, you know, have the best staff. You know, you want to have people that have done it for a while. Um, you know, and they're going to be, you know, they're going to be expensive, um, and I think rightly so. You've got to look at, um, against your revenues, what's going to be your supply cost. Um, you know, and that's, you know, uh, as a percentage, certainly the biggest number. You know, um, we use a uh, fairly sophisticated inventory control system because I can tell you when I got into this business, I had no idea, you know, as a percentage, what our medical supply cost was per, per case. And, you know, it's very easy um, if a physician happens to be overusing um, supplies to lose money on, on any particular case. Um, today, we can track every single case and look at our costs against those case, cases. And should we see a situation where we're losing money on a t certain type of procedure, we'd probably recommend to the physicians that, you know, to keep those patients in the hospital. They could afford to lose, you know, as much money as possible. Um, anyway, your, your other costs include uh, the medical equipment, obviously, that you need, you know, typically a C-arm, a table, ultrasound, um, monitoring devices. Um, and then you have, you know, your, your general administrative um, expenses, um, billing and collection, um, uh, credentialing of physicians in this, in this, uh, in this environment, um, and uh, accreditation, which uh, Dr. Kassab also spoke about. Um, the way things stand with accreditation right now, it's actually not mandated in every state. Um, it's probably about uh, half of the states right now require you to get some form of accreditation. And some require that, like New York, um, before you even open the facility. Um, and depending on the time of the year, like everything else, um, that, could, that could delay you quite a bit. Um, I realize this is pretty much an impossible slide to read, um, but this, this really um, puts the uh, pencil to the paper in terms of, at the end of the day, being able to show us um, with an average uh, reimbursement per case um, whether we're going to make money or lose money based on, on case volume. So in this particular slide, we showed um, 20 cases at around $3,800 um, average, um, you know, on the low end, and I believe uh, 40 cases, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 70 cases at the high end, um, generating uh, revenues anywhere from $75,000 a month to $264,000 a month against um, all the expenses that we, we just went over. And um, I believe, you know, kind of the bottom line to this is um, you probably needed, um, you know, 30 cases or so at, at roughly $4,000 uh, average reimbursement um, to be in a break-even situation. All right, just to go over quickly what your options are in terms of developing an office-based center, um, and this was sort of touched on earlier. Um, you can certainly go it alone. Um, again, you know, I, I think it's a pretty substantial undertaking. I've been in healthcare for 25 years. I developed uh, 70 outpatient centers before I got into um, office-based surgery. And I can tell you, um, there's a learning curve. Um, but aside from that, you know, you, you're assuming all the financial risk. And, and typically, that can be anywhere from $750,000 to $2 million. Um, as an initial investment. You could retain a management company, um, really on a consulting basis if that's something that interests you. 
um, to help you um, with this task. Or you could partner with a management company, um, you know, which in our case um, is, is typically a situation where we actually take all of the risk. Um, our, our relationships have been that, you know, we provide the capital for, uh, for a startup um, and an ongoing operation. And we also structure it in a way, uh, typically, where the physicians are guaranteed um, to more than double what you're getting to do procedures in a, in a hospital setting today. So if you, you were getting $500 for an average case, every time you walk into this setting, you know you're going to get $1,000. Thank you very much. If I can have my mic up, we, we uh, are a little over time. This is an important topic, so Joff has agreed that we can take some uh, questions and, and spend a few time discussing this. I'll start off with a question for Dr. Kassab. If you're in an environment where the primary care is really pretty much locked in by the hospital system, thereby limiting your access to those patients, doesn't that really sort of change your opportunity to be successful in that environment with an outpatient lab? That's a very, very good question. Um, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a shift in, uh, <clears throat> the, I, not a shift, the, the hype for uh, physicians, for full employment with the hospital, that hype has, has fizzled, at least in our, uh, in our community. However, uh, with a uh, lot of private ACOs coming on board, and uh, uh, the government encouraging, leaning towards these private ACOs. When you've seen the literature lately that uh, uh, the government feels that's going to be a bigger money saver, uh, that these private ACOs are going to provide better value than the hospital-based ACOs. Uh, yes, pay, you know the physicians can't control their referrals. However, uh, with, under the Affordable Care Act, the patient can decide wherever they want to go, number, number one. Number two, uh, uh, I think a lot of it is going to change because you're seeing a lot of consolidation among hospital systems right now because they're hurting. So the first, the first thing when hospitals hurt is they consolidate. So we're going we, we, to gonna see a partnership between hospitals and uh, and uh, these, uh, these groups. We need to stick together. We need to coalesce. Right now, we are forming a OBL society. We actually, we have to, we're going to convene. The first meeting is going to be next month. And this is going to allow us to have a voice, lobby, the same way hospitals have lobbied for many years. And just, it's crazy. They were able to pass the HOPS system. They were able to tell, convince the government we have to charge two and a half times more to do a CAT scan under a hospital reimbursement than to do it in a, in a private setting. That is crazy. This is going to change. This is going to change. So yes, it is difficult to see these, these uh, 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 patients that uh, are uh, within, uh, within a, uh, a, a full-time hospital employment but this is going to change. And we're going to see the ACOs down the line becoming basically a, a quasi-HMOs also. Things are, are, are going to happen in the future. I think outpatient vascular labs are here to stay. Uh, we've seen it with the, with the ambulatory surgical centers. We've seen it with dialysis centers. Get on board, guys. This is, you know, today 20%. That's the reason why I said I predict 80% in, in, uh, in five years will be done on an outpatient basis, it's, it's almost one-third the cost. And we have to take care of 10 times more patients. We got to have to do it for less money and more efficiently. Thank you. Uh, I have, an, <clears throat> I have a, just a little argument I want to make. You know, the previous two talks that Dr. Shamshak and I talk about, more than 50% of cardiologists are employed by the hospital. So now, if the, that means the only way to do an outpatient cath lab is to be joined with the hospital because uh, I don't think the hospital will allow you to go out and open a cath lab on your own. It's not only the primary care referral. Right. As an employed cardiologist, 
I don't think you can allow you to go out and open your own cath lab. Um, uh, what no. do you think of this? No. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to take this answer. <clears throat> um, the reason why I showed that the place of service, 21 and 22, the hospital, they, they asked for it themselves. They were greedy when they lobbied for a POS 21 and tw POS 22. And because of that greed, they said, you know what? We're going we're gonna to we're gonna have to bill for everything. We're going to be paid for the supply. It's a fee for service. We, they threw the physicians under the bus for so many years, and they still do. But what's happening right now is they cannot do that on their own because if you go outpatient, if you go outpatient as a hospital, it has to be a POS 22. It has to be a hospital-based reimbursement. It has to be more expensive. They have to bill for, for, uh, for, uh, for the supplies and everything else. And they're not providing any, any cost saving to the system, none whatsoever. So it is not, it is not a, 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 an advantage to have the hospital, uh, to have the hospital do it on an outpatient basis. You know, they can do it, but just for, for the sake of being more efficient, for the sake of having a more pleasing environment to the patient, but it's not, they're not going to save costs. And let me tell you one thing. I've been approached, and Keith knows about that, I've been approached by a major, major hospital system that I'm meeting with next week about partnership with us in an outpatient basis. It's a hospital system. Why do they have to do it? Because they, they're locked into a 21 and 22, and we are a POS 11. We could be a POS 24. They could own a POS 24. They could, they could play around and go back to their hospital enterprise and put everything in the name of the enterprise, but they cannot own more than 40% of it. So just, yes, it's going to be very difficult for them to do it. Um, I just have one quick comment. I, I think, for, first of all, you've got you to evaluate your individual market. Okay, there are, there are markets that are dominated by, by hospital systems. Um, and as a consequence, they, they dominate physician ownership um, and, and referral patterns. Those are markets I'd prefer to stay out of, okay? Um, I, I think the, the dynamic is kind of anybody's guess in terms of, you know, where we go uh, reimbursement-wise. But, um, you know, the market in uh, Dearborn, there's so many independent um, interventional cardiologists, vascular surgeons right now that um, it's a great opportunity for, for a center like this. Um, and, and that's something you got to evaluate from, from market to market, you know, in terms of, you know, what primary care is like, where else you get referral sources, is your center going to do a lot of dialysis access, you know, um, can you do some of this ancillary um, type procedures, uh, you know, like kyphoplasties or uh, uh, UFEs. I mean, there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot that goes into the decision of, of what, you know, whether office-based surgery makes sense in your market. You know, like, uh, it's kind of like we, we're talking about two things here, but I think it's, they're, they're both important because the market is going toward employed type of employee, employment. But outpatient office, it's better to be independent. Yeah. So that is, and I'm not sure which one is going to like stay. So, Well, well the, the only other thing is that, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that, uh, um, you know, a lot of these hospital systems are, are concerned and, and, you know, see the possibility that reimbursement for a lot of these procedures goes away. And another way to incentivize the physicians they buy is to have office-based labs. Um, I have had several conversations with, with CEOs of hospitals that are interested in, uh, in buying our labs and or partnering with us um, because they see that day coming. Um, most of them won't admit it right now because it really goes against everything that, they, that they've been doing. But that's a possibility. And again, it's kind of anyone's guess at this point. And that, that was going to be my next question. What's to prevent the hospitals in the interest of maintaining control to do just that, just like they've done with outpatient facilities in general, dialysis centers, ambulatory surgical centers. I mean, there is precedent for them to do this. And if they want to maintain their profit margin for these procedures, push it out of the hospital and have their own independent centers. And I think the physician ownership will go on, but to a certain extent. 
because hospital cannot, uh, hospital cannot own every single physician. They just can't afford it. So at some point, you know, and there's obviously a lot of resistance as well. There's this, you know, divide in the community that we see even in Chicago between, uh, you know, uh, physicians that are willing to be owned by hospitals and some that don't. And there's a, it's a pretty large divide. And I think that's the thing, the people that are not physician owned, they stick together. And usually, you know, in terms of looking at uh, vascular practice, you don't get a lot of it from cardiologists. You know, usually you get that from podiatrists, you get that from primary care physicians, your family practice physicians, and a lot of those are not physician-owned or hospital-owned. Hmm. I didn't spend much time on that slide, but the biggest driver, 40% of the, of the business driven to the uh, to, to this arena is, is, is true podiatrist, and I agree with you, Dr. Golzar. Uh, uh, the, the second, actually, is, are the general cardiologists. The second referral, uh, which, is, which is bigger than, uh, than the primary care physician. Mm. And I must add one more thing, if you don't mind, is, is if hospitals want, want to do it, they cannot create the atmosphere that we have been able to create for our patients yeah. and our physicians. Yes, sir. You know, you walk in into hospital and you have a nut in your stomach, at least I do. You walk into the, to, 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 to your own center and you say, ah, <laughs> and the patient says, ah. And you know what? They can, they can, they can, they can match, the, the, they can accept the lower reimbursement rate in order to be competitive, but they never, because of the bureaucracy in the hospital, they can never create that, that, that pleasing environment for the patient and for the physicians. And Dr. Kassab, I think one of the key things that you presented in one of your talks is the survival of this paradigm is going to be regulation, self-regulation, because all you need is a few bad apples to do some bad cases or do, you know, not legitimate cases, and then things are going to really go downhill quickly because the hospitals are going to be looking at these uh, centers with the microscope. And that's why I think regulation and self-policing is very important. Any questions from the audience? Um, thank you. This is a very important topic. I think I want to address this to Dr. Abbas. Um, the big bear in the room, especially in the state of Illinois, is uh, CON and the um, uh, as a podiatrist, I am keenly interested in office-based surgery. I do a lot of office-based surgery. However, the facility fee in the state of Illinois is not reimbursable because this is a CON state and it's a very corrupt state. Um, I hope nobody's in here too. And until the CON is disbanded, uh, it's going to be difficult for any physician to do any office base and get full reimbursement from the big insurance companies. Is there somebody in the vascular society now that is working to uh, overturn the CON in the state of Illinois? And what do you all think about that? I think there's a little confusion possibly on your, on your part because um, what we're talking about here is what's called the office-based uh, surgery. Um, ambulatory surgery centers, ASCs, um, I believe require a CON in the state of Illinois um, and do in, again, probably half the states out there. And, and in terms of the podiatrist doing work in, a, in, a, in an outpatient setting, I think you'd want to work in an, in an ASC because that's what is reimbursement. In the, in the office setting, we'd love to have you in our office, but there's no reimbursement. There's no additional reimbursement than your professional fee right now. So speaking of office-based surgery, of doing it in your office. Now, if you do it in your office, you do need a CON in order to get the facility fee from the insurance companies because Blue Cross Blue Shield does not recognize an office-based surgery for the facility fee unless you have a CON in the state of Illinois. Now, there are states you can run over to Indiana, you can run down south somewhere, but in the state of Illinois, that's how it is right now. Yeah. Because it's a code. It's uh, yeah, an I think the point is that, you know, uh, surgery done in a podiatry center, like amputations and debridement and things like that, is different, you're right, than the physician-owned lab or, or the office-based lab, because that's actually an extension of your office, and it's more of a cath lab. If, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'd love to see you. I'd love to have you over. I actually can stay at my house. You get one fee only. Yes, you do. But you know what? Because... There's a, there's a fee structure right now, it's a fee for service for office, and 
you know, every fee is different. Some are essentially the same as you would get for just a professional component as if you did it in the hospital. And, that, and that's true of, of certain vascular procedures as, as well. And, that, and that's one I was talking about earlier about, you know, you have to look at certain procedures not being profitable in this setting. We, ha we have some of those on the vascular side as well. Right. Yes. That's yeah. right. I want to thank all the panelists. I think this has really been a fascinating discussion and a, and a great session. So thank you all for your participation. We'll conclude.